our lecture tonight is on the flame of the resurrection. This vital subject you will find to be full of meaning. Most of us have thought rather nebulously about the spirit of the resurrection, just as most of us think rather nebulously about a spirit. So I think it is important that we realize that if our physical bodies are a television set, then the spirit is the energy and current that makes the picture that flows through that set. I hope that makes good sense to you because we are going to have to define our subjects in order to create understanding. Jesus said to the people that came to him after his resurrection, touch me not, for I am yet not ascended to my Father which is in heaven, but I ascend unto my Father, unto your God, and unto my God. Why did Jesus say, touch me not? We know the answer. Most people do not. The spirit of the resurrection flame is tangible. So is a gas jet. And if it's a lit gas jet and you put your finger in it, it burns. And if it's a high tension current, it can kill you or shock you to death or knock you out. And there was a very definite reason why Jesus told them not to touch him. Because the spirit of the resurrection flame was actually blazing through his body. And for them to have touched him could have meant instant death by lightning. The late Marie Corelli, in her book, A Romance of Two Worlds, brings out this point in a most interesting story. She gives a cosmic creed in A Romance of Two Worlds. This is not theory. We have proven the spirit of the resurrection. We know that it is a tangible thing. Today, millions of people touch, taste, feel, and handle religion as they would a piece of meat. It has become a carcass rather than a living creation. And I think this is a sacrifice as well as a sacrilege because this is a case of the dead letter killing our spiritual aspirations and ambitions. If our religion has nothing to offer us but platitudes and promises of the hereafter with no potential whatsoever that can be realized and affect us now, it is dead. It is the letter that killeth. But if our faith, our religion, our inner experience can be something that quickens us, that impels us to seek further, that teaches us that there are goals to be obtained, that are obtainable, that we can know, that we can realize, then it has meaning to us, our religion, that is. This is what the masters want us to have the religion of the spirit. The religion of the spirit is not the type of religion that we demonstrate of necessity by jumping and screaming and hollering and being disorderly. It is a religion that impels us to understand the meaning of love. The meaning of love that does not have as the objects of its affection those who necessarily agree with the person or the thoughts of the lover. If we are to love mankind, we do not love them because they are going to do something for us. 
We love them simply for love's sweet sake itself. And this, of course, makes it necessary for us to divorce ourselves from the idea of loving with an expectation of reward. We love to give, not to get. Of course, it is an absolute fact that this type of love gives us far more than the type of love that merely loves to get. If you and I love to get, and that's our only reason for loving, the object of our affections can soon become one to be discarded, one to be cast aside. Because we have fulfilled whatever requirement we thought we could get from the beloved, and perhaps a new flower should be plucked. This is a little side issue, but I merely bring it in because I think love is important in order to understand the meaning of the resurrection flame. The resurrection flame is a composite manifestation. Actually, it is the threefold flame focalized because it requires the threefold flame to produce the resurrection. But an interesting thing about the resurrection flame that is also involved with the ascension flame is that the resurrection flame, although composed of the triune elements, the pink, the blue, and the gold, becomes white in color with a very pale aura of golden yellow around the edge. And at times there is a flash of a little blue that can be seen in the middle of the resurrection flame. Now these things are superficialities. They're not desperately important. I merely state them so that you will understand that the resurrection flame has a distinctive appearance all of its own. Although it's composed of these colors, the colors seem to blend as all seven colors do into the white light. Now the resurrection flame is qualified by God with a specific nature. It is a flame of resuscitation. When a fireman finds a child that is drowned that he suspects may not be dead, he applies artificial respiration. What we are applying when we apply the resurrection flame is the flame of resuscitation. The resurrection of Jesus was a miracle. There are those who say there are no miracles anywhere. They say that miracles are only names for natural law functioning. Fine. If this rose known by any other name smells just as sweet, we're interested in the smell. We know that Jesus rose from the dead. We know that the greatest hope for mankind is continuity of life. When we see some of the struggles that are in the world, and the banalities of the world, and we sense the heaviness of the flesh and some of the disgusting side of life, people wonder why should we want to live forever? Why should we wish immortal life? Well, the why is because if we wish immortal life, we ought also to wish immortal life with immortal love and immortal wisdom to go along with it. Some of you are familiar with the three wishes where the man had three wishes granted unto him. The first wish was that he would be rich. I think then that when I tell you the rest of this, you'll see what I'm talking about. He wanted to be rich. And so a member of his family was cut in half with a saw and they brought all of the money that he had asked for to his door that day in a check. And they said, here's the money. So he wanted to be rich and he lost a member of his family. So he had another wish. The second wish was that the member of his family would now be raised from the dead. So he asked for the wish and within a short time afterward he heard the old familiar steps at the door. And then he heard the knock. He used the third wish and wished him to return back to the grave from whence he came. <laughs> 
So we see that if we wish for riches and honor, and we wish for many of these things in this world, it may not actually be the answer. The answer is to learn to live in whatever state we are in and to realize that we can change and command our life. It's better to be happy than to have other things added to our life that do not contribute to our spiritual wealth. And so the resurrection flame is not only for the purpose of raising the body, but it is for the purpose of raising and illumining the mind. Because it is more important that we learn how to live than it is that we just live. It is more important that we learn how to love than it is that we just love. It is more important that we understand how to use knowledge than that we have knowledge. When you stop to think about all these things, we know the meaning of St. Paul's admonishment. Study to show thyself approved unto God. All right now, let's break man down. Let's break him down into his parts. Man is actually one being, but he functions through all these envelopes. The physical envelope, the emotional envelope, the mental envelope, and the envelope of memory. He has all these elements. We look at the physical envelope and we see that the building blocks, the bricks that compose this, we call cells. We break the cells down and we find the building blocks of molecules. We go down from the molecular world into the world of the atom. And finally into the Lilliputian world of the centrosome our central sun of the atom with the little planetary systems and miniature solar systems vibrating around it, the whirling electrons, the world of the electron. Now we could go still further, for matter is almost uniquely divisible, infinitely divisible. You can keep breaking it down until you wouldn't believe how far down you can go. It's something like that picture of the little girl and the dog looking into the mirror that they had back in the 1800s. She's looking into the mirror and she's holding a picture in her hand. And on the picture that she's holding in her hand, you see the same little girl and the same little dog. And then on that picture, you see another picture. And that's the same little girl and the same little dog. And on and on and on till the artist ran out of space. But you just somehow know that this goes on infinitely. Just as the railroad tracks converge and seem to blend into one track from the two, so we realize that there is a telescope into infinity and that our consciousness can move over that track. Let us then realize that in this Lilliputian world of the world within, the physical octave, that there is a natural accumulation of substance. What kind of substance? The substance of thought and feeling and of memory. But what kind of thought, what kind of feeling, what kind of memory? Memory of old hurts, as the Buddha said. He beat me, he hurt me, he did harm to me, I suffered. Man's experiences are basically a history of his suffering of the suffering of the ego. We are all in the same boat. We have continual experiences that seem to generate in us a state of unhappiness. Because our lives are linked to what other people think of us. Do they like me? Will they do things that will help me to enjoy life? I'm a businessman. Will they buy my product? I'm in the professions. Will they like me personally? Will they patronize me? And if you're on the stage, will I be able to win my audiences 10 years from now after I'm old and gray? People ask themselves, wives ask themselves, will my husband love me tomorrow as he does today? Will my wife love me? 
Will my children respect me? What will my banker think of me? Will the taxi driver think that I'm a nice man or a nice woman? So I'll give him a tip. I'll make it a big tip so he'll remember me. There are so many things in life that are involved with ourselves. And every little hurt is a hunk of coal. It's a little tarry jelly. It settles down between these atoms. It gets down into our very bones, into our structure. And there is a structuring within ourselves of old hurts and old decays and old thoughts of terror and fear. These thoughts accumulate. We build and build and build on them. And after a while in the spaces in ourselves, we have accumulated so much of this substance that it becomes weighty and dense. Now we have discussed the physical. What of the structure of the emotions? Here we're dealing with natural turbulence anyway. Here we're dealing with a realm where the coiled springs of human thought and feeling really bounce around. Talk about kinetic energy. You have the kinetic energy of massive echoes that retaliate through space. My Lord, he didn't love me. And their heart broken because someone didn't love them. Someone didn't care enough to take the girl out the second time. Someone didn't remember a birthday. Someone blocked someone in a parking lot and it happened to be a next door neighbor. Who does he think he is? And on and on and on. And our emotional body becomes a coiled spring. And these springs begin to compress and they get very, very tight and our physical body winds up with it. And then we call the chiropractor to take out the tensions. <laughs> it's true. It's absolutely true. But what about the mind? Are you aware of the fact that the mind becomes involved with the emotions? And the emotions actually learn to rule the mind. And all of the fineness of our mind that like a precision Swiss watch ticks away the moments of our life, becomes involved in emotional episodes so that the mind can no longer think in straight lines between two points. That the mind is actually a sort of a bobsled. And the emotions just take us up and down on that. We begin to think and to revolve our feelings. Now you have to think about this to grasp what I'm talking about tonight. We think about our emotions. In other words, we not only emote, but we also have in our memory and in our mind the story of our emotions. We even tell each other, I felt terrible about it, that I cooked a meal for him and he didn't like it. You see. And therefore, all of this sinks down and gets between the pores of the mind, the pores of the emotions and the pores of the physical form, invades the memory and structures in the memory titanic monoliths of all of the unhappiness we have ever had in the world. And we do not forget it. We keep remembering it. Every time something happens that's parallel to it, we say, that reminds me of the time that I parked at the fire hydrant, and so on. All right, enough of that. It's too much like life. But that's not the real life. That's only the pseudo-life that we live. And the resurrection flame is interested not in just raising the body alone, but the resurrection flame is interested in consuming all of this dross, this dead wood, this tarry substance, this accumulation of mortal filth which we have incremented into ourselves, into the compartments of being. We have so much of it there that when the Christ and the masters actually put their presence out into the ethers or the angelic host try to get through and reach us, 
There is so much of this in the inn of being that we do not have room for the great and ethereal manifestations of assistance that the masters have and long to bestow upon us. It's like the pot that's already full. You can't pour any more in it or it will run over. So you pour in some of that good stuff and the bad stuff runs over with a little bit of good stuff and there isn't too much done for a person. You can't change it without dumping the whole thing out. And that's what the resurrection flame is for. Because in one sense of the word, a person would be better off to die to the pseudo-self. Yet, of course, I'm not suggesting that we commit suicide. I say we should commit the suicide of transformation. And that is not suicide. That is monocide, I guess. It's the becoming of the being, the one being that we really are. Why God is so happy, so tremendously happy to actually be invited into our world and to bring all of the power and happiness that he has in his world, that he can scarcely wait to drop that golden chain, that link between reality and ourselves around our neck. He wants to do it. The story of the prodigal proves it. The story of the good shepherd reiterates it. We realize that we need all that. So just what is the resurrection flame? The resurrection flame is just another name for a certain regenerative energy of God. A regenerative energy that possesses the capacity to quicken the atoms, to quicken the electrons, to re-energize the form, to transform the form. You know, in the story of David Lloyd on Mount Shasta, we learn about the transformation that occurred when the messenger took his hands in his and at that precise moment all of his hair that had turned white returned to its natural color and we learn that he began to rise up into the air. We have experiences of levitation all through history, you know. And as he went up into the air there, his body was changed. The body no longer showed the appearance of age. The blood in his veins became golden liquid light and all of the organs below the heart disappeared and he had a glorified body. Well, most of us have studied in a way this idea from the scriptures because it clearly states concerning the resurrection that with what body do the dead come, says St. Paul. He says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Having begun in the spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? In another place, it says, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In another place, it says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God. Let us then try to understand that he's talking about the outer garment. The inner garment, the inner reality, is communicated to us because we are that inner reality. We are not the outer self. We are the inner man of the heart. But basically, man's thoughts, man's feelings, man's memory revolves around the old tintype, the old album, the old human creation that grandfather and grandmother and mother and father and daughter and son and children all have an all-out picture. We become a sort of a chain. Talk about man descending from apes. We might just as well have. It's true. Unless we have the divine reality and actually begin the practice of the presence of God as Brother Lawrence talked about. Now there are many mystics and there are many spiritual teachers and there are many spiritual teachings. But I believe that I would prefer the aeroplane route to the ox cart. I think that we may be able to get to Rome by all these methods. And if Rome symbolizes heaven, well and good. But I believe that I would rather go to Rome in an airplane or a rocket and get there in 10 minutes than I would to spend 50 years traveling across the world by ox cart. And I think that the resurrection flame is a more direct route than just karma yoga or the yoga 
of good works. I do not doubt that a mother and a father or a humanitarian who would spend a lifetime in service to mankind through the ritual of karma alone could probably find their way back to God without any practice whatsoever of the presence of God except in world service. This is perhaps one way, and I think it is good. But I suspect that we ought to employ the most direct route because we can do so and still serve our fellow men. The resurrection flame is, I think, one of the roots because it is a part of the initiatic system. The initiatic system is a triangle. It is the transfiguration, the resurrection, and the ascension. The ordinary Western Christianity that is taught today in the churches emphasizes to our consciousness the Via Dolorosa, the sorrowful road, the seven last words of Christ on the cross, the idea that man is born and man must die. The Bhagavad Gita says of man, Never the spirit was born, the spirit shall cease to be never, dead though the house of it seems. So we understand then that our life is hid with Christ in God if we practice the presence of God. And practice we must if we are to be perfected. And draw we must the resurrection flame. Transfiguration, resurrection and ascension. Three initiations which man, Western man, ought to have. Eastern man, too, can profit by it. For I do not believe that the lightning that came out of the East and traveled to the West, the massive mission of the universal Christ, journeying then from Judea and the land of the Hebrews into Western Europe and moving through the cycle of the church and its many liaisons with mankind. I do not believe that this is a dead issue. I think that there remains today in Western Christianity the elements that can be combined for a new order of the ages. I believe, however, that the Christian church will of necessity pass through many changes, that these changes are essential for the survival of the church and I further believe that the church is not aware of these facts. I think, however, that some among the church and some among Western men are very poignantly aware of it. I do not believe, however, that enough of mankind are aware of it to actually, through media, at this time, influence the unwashed masses. We should understand, then, that we have a solemn responsibility every day of the week to try to influence our fellow man. I do not think we should do as the poor salesman does. Find a candidate who has no money, prop him up against a building, stand there with a megaphone and shout into his ear, won't you be saved, dear brother? And he says, no, I'm not interested. No, nah, don't care. I think that's ridiculous. I think we should drop like a hot potato every individual who doesn't think enough of himself and of his divine opportunity to recognize that what we see in this world couldn't possibly be of God. He's got to realize that there's something wrong with our society and that it is sick indeed, but he's got to also recognize that it has the power within itself to galvanize itself into action and become healed. The healing process of our society will come about when we have enough people working with people, for there are hungry hearts out here in the world who are waiting for the message. You can do an awful lot as a divine missionary for God right where you are. But you've got to know what you're talking about. And it takes a few years, a few months, a little while of preparation before you really will know. In the meantime, you have to have some faith in the reality of those who are teaching the law to you. I know myself. I traveled a long and hard road in this embodiment to find my way. And it was not easy. I was laughed at, called insane, even by people on the spiritual path. But I knew that God was real, and I had absolute faith that somehow or other He would show me the path that would enable me to do the work which I came to earth to do. For I believe that every life, as Mazzini said, is a mission. And I think that each of you have a specific God mission 
to perform in this world. I do not believe that every mission is the same, but I think that each one is needed to complement the other. Therefore, we have to recognize that Western man has a job to do today, and the time is short. We can neglect our office. We can neglect ourselves. We can forfeit every opportunity that life gives to us. This is our privilege if we wish to take it. We've done it many times before. As Risa Stevens said, she was singing in the Met one time when suddenly she lost all consciousness of the Met and of her environment and the surroundings. She was then once again in the Colosseums of Rome. She was singing her areas before the emperor and the situation was completely changed. We have to recognize that each of us has played many roles in many times in the past, but I think that most of us have played more the role of the laggard, more the role of the unsophisticated person who has primarily lived as a vegetable. Perhaps those in this room and those in these rooms are people who have thought more than ordinary men. I am sure there's been some preparation in your world that has enabled you to receive the messages of the masters here today and to love the masters and to recognize the divine realities that are within you. I do not, however, believe that recognition without action is going to make any change in your world or mine that didn't occur in the distant past. I hope then, as some of our own devotees here have said, that all of us can bear fruit. I think we must be convinced of the natural loveliness of God, of His devotion to us at any age, His determination to use us as His instrument, and our realization that it is not too late. I remember the late Bernard McFadden, who jumped out of an airplane when he was 80 years old, and more. He said, it is never too late to make your life over. And I think this eternal spirit of youth is a part, perhaps, of the resurrection flame because we have to burn up the energies of old ideas and old structures that have brought us not to the feet of the masters but to our knees in horrible subjection to all kinds of dominant forces that have ruled our world. There is nothing in the world so terrifying as a man to be ruled by forces from within himself which he cannot govern, nor is there anything so glorifying and so sweet as to be able to have the natural divine expression of life like the power in a seed begin to press through the consciousness and raise a man and his world into a sense of meaningful reality. Let us then realize that the resurrection spirit is tangible, that it starts through the ritual of transfiguration. What is transfiguration? Well, we all know that whatever state of consciousness we are in right now, this is a configuration of thought and feeling. Be it good, bad, or indifferent, this is what we are. If we're going to have transfiguration, we have to pass from that death onto the life of God. When we do this, we have the mountaintop experience. Our religion becomes then not just something that you can spout out as the Apostles' Creed, but it becomes something that we live by within ourselves. Let us understand that this is full of divine meaning. It is the resurrection flame. In the physical octave, it's like lightning. It actually surges through the electronic essence of our being, and it pours through our flesh form, and it would produce lightning in our consciousness and in our body. And if someone touched us, it could cause them sudden death. This, of course, is the reason why the great masters sometimes do not touch the chilas or why they are requesting the chilas not to touch them. There are other times when the currents are such that we wish to share them with you and we reach out and go to you with the offering of our love and the love of the great ascended being who has spoken through us. The resurrection flame is tangible and it affects the body. But how does it affect the body? It affects the body through the consciousness. How does it affect the consciousness? It affects the consciousness through the mind and through the feelings. 
it affects the consciousness through the memory. Because we have above the consciousness a hopper. The hopper is a triangle. And the triangle consists of thought, feeling, and memory. Thought, feeling, and memory pour into the consciousness a steady stream of what seems real to us. And if the resurrection flame is to come into our consciousness, it has to come through the avenue of the feelings. We have to get the feeling of the Holy Spirit as the activator of universal principle. Universal principle, that is, of the resurrection. We have to understand that the word resurrection means resurgence. It has been stated as resurgem Christos. The resurgem Christos means that the power we once knew with God before the world was at the moment of creation, when we became an individualized soul essence, that that power which has waned in our world is once again surging through us and in that surge conveying to us a renewal of the first flame of the resurrection which we had the first Easter morning when we came out of the ungrund of the uncreated into the grund of the created. Before that, we were non-existent. We were a part of the great cosmic power of the infinite I am presence. Then God said, here, mighty ocean, take this one drop out and let's individualize it. So we come out and we said, why I am? Because we were suddenly aware of self. Before that, we had the consciousness of an amoeba, in a sense of the word, although a mighty amoeba, because we're talking about the one-celled nature of the Almighty himself before he had subdivided himself into anything at all. He was just light and love and life, as far as potential goes. Now he takes this love, this light and life, and he begins to dip it out of the ocean of himself, and he says, here you are, one drop. You have all of my qualities. You're not lacking in anything that I have. You just don't have my quantity because you have to share my quantity with so many other billion life streams or quadrillion or sextillion or whatever you wish to make of it because the cosmos has a lot of life streams in it. All right, now this drop of water comes into individuality. Well, what is it going to do in individuality? It's going to return back to the ocean. Well, that sounds kind of silly, doesn't it? Here we have the cosmic dance of the Hindus. We have the cosmic dance where all this great dance goes in, you know, they wiggle their little fingers and everything, and finally they come to the end of the dance, and like the dying swan, the dancer begins to fold the hands in, the head goes down, and all is still. And where they practice this on the stage with full lighting effects, they gradually dim the light, and you see the central figure at the end of the dance, in the great pause when the manvantar has come to an end, just fade out as all the light is gone, and that's it. Then... It's all started all over again as the Manvantar goes forth into manifestation and the cosmic dance begins all over. And the whole idea of it is that God has purpose behind it, extending himself through time and space so that each drop of water has not only subjective awareness, but objective awareness. We have to have both subjective and objective awareness. We have to have not only an understanding of life, being able to say, well, this is the state of nirvana, I'm going to describe it. I've never passed through it, but I'll tell you all about it. So now we're dealing with a man who is able to tell you all about it, Lord Gautama, for example. He's passed into nirvana, and he returns to take his position as Lord of the world. Well, certainly he's able to tell us about nirvana, but most of the world's pundits are of the opinion that all they need to do is read a couple of books and they can describe for all mankind exactly every spiritual state without ever experiencing any of it for themselves. This activity is consecrated and dedicated to the experiences of God in the personal life of our members, which experiences are not put on display in order to impress people with our greatness, for we do not need to impress God who already knows all about us. I hope you all grasp this because the flame of the resurrection is the source of your energy. It will transfigure you and you can have the mountaintop experience. It will carry you to the point of resurrection where your mind is no longer in the groove of dead works but is free to reach out into the universe and say, give me, give me that I may give. Do you hear that? Give me that I may give. 
We don't ask to receive in order to receive and be like the Dead Sea, let everything flow into me. But we say, give me that I may give. That's the whole key. And that is why the resurrection flame is given. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. This is bestowal. It means that the Christ could bestow on others. And every one of you should get the spirit of the resurrection in your world so that you can give it to someone else. And you can't give it to someone else if you don't have it. You've got to have it. And it will fire your mind. It will raise your body. It will move through your feeling world and still the restlessness that inhabits man's feeling world until you can sit anywhere and be content because God is there and the resurrection flame is burning and you know that in a due course of time you're going to come not just to your Gethsemane. You may come there in the dark night of the soul, but you'll come not only to your Gethsemane, to your crucifixion, to your Golgotha, but you'll also come to the place where you reach Bethany's hill. And then as you stand towering at the top of Bethany's hill, when you look all around you and you survey all your past lives, you'll say, well, all of this struggle was worth it, for now I'm going back to the Father consciously. You see, the Father doesn't like the idea of taking you back unconsciously. And this is what happens most of the time. People pass out in a coma. They go back to God in a coma. God doesn't want us to do that. He wants us to go back in a period, not a comma. <laughs> well, that's right. A period over which we command. A period where we're conscious. We've come to the end. We say, I finished my course. I fought the good fight of faith. I've kept the faith. I've kept the flame. I've lived and I've moved. And now here I am. Father, I'm returning to your heart. Because when I get back there, I'm going to work for those people down below. And here is the whole answer. Spiritualism, bosh. This activity is not spiritualistic in any of its phases or operations. Spiritualism is out. This activity is an activity of light because we believe in eternal life. We believe in eternal life and we believe that when a man ascends back to God, he has some love for the people that are down here in this world, many of whom he knew through many of his past embodiments before he ever ascended. And he's going to stand up there and that's exactly what St. Germain does. It's exactly what Jesus does. Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. With this promise, he bound himself to this age. He bound himself to this promise, to this planet. Why? Because he loved the world so much, because God loved him so much. And that's what we all have to get in our consciousness. And we don't have to stand still. We can make progress. And we make it through the resurrection flame, and it's a tangible flame. It's just as real as if you stuck your finger in an electrical socket and got a shock. And there's a lot of shocks to be garnered from the resurrection flame. And it's yours. You can have it. And after you get it, the next step is the ascension flame. And that you obtain through winning your ascension. This is a whole subject by itself. 